Church, I said, praise the Lord. I pray the Lord will continue to bless us in Jesus' name. And in your personal life. And in your family. I pray that this retreat will be a point of reference in Jesus' name. God will bless you. And do spectacular things in your spiritual life in your physical, natural life, and in your family life and professional life, in Jesus' name. Unforgettable. Somebody help me shout, unforgettable. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We thank you because we know you are a great God, the God that cannot fail, a covenant-keeping God. We're asking, Lord, at this time, you emphasize and enrich our lives with your word in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that none of us will go empty-handed. Perfect everything that concerns us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We're coming to Romans chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith. Think about that. Therefore, being justified by faith. It's been coming from chapter 1. And from chapter 1, he had emphasized the life of the average man, average woman. And the life of everyone in the world. The life of sinning, the life of abandoning the Lord. And yet, you see, there's only one way we can come back to God, not only come back to God, be forgiven, not only that, justified. And it is the faith we have in Christ that brings that justification. It tells us in uh, chapter 1, verse 17. It says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just or the justified shall live by faith in ourselves, in our strength, in our struggling, in our trial, in our doing the best we can, in our turning over a new leaf, in making new year resolutions, there's not much we can do. Our lives remain defiled, sinful, guilty, unacceptable in the sight of the Lord. Until that point comes in our lives. That we turn to God, having failed in our own strength. And we turn to God who justifies us, who cleanses us, who redeems our lives. And he repeats that over and over. And it says, it's for the Jew as well as for the Gentile. It says, there is no difference. It's an oppression of the heart that God himself must perform. Chapter 2 verse 29. For he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and it not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And then he goes to chapter 3. What are we going to say then? As Somebody being justified without faith in his own strength by his own power. Chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them, that under the law, look at this, that every mouth may be stopped 
and all the world become guilty before God. All the world guilty before God. What's the condition, conclusion of that? Verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's telling us then, justification is not found in man. Forgiveness, salvation, freedom, freedom from condemnation is not found in the struggles of men, in the religions of men, in the character of men, in the sacrifice of any man. It says, for all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. But he's not talking about somebody that found justification. And he mentions the name, chapter 4. He says in verse 3, For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He finds somebody here. And it says that one Abraham was justified by faith, not by some work of righteousness. Look at verse 22. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness about you and I. What happens to the rest of the world? Verse 23. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed that it was imputed to him. But for us also, you and I, Gentiles, those who believe in Christ, as Abraham believed the promise of God, for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe. Righteousness will be imputed unto us if we believe. Justification, salvation, eternal life will be granted us if we believe. It says, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. The saying, Christ has died for you and died for me. He has taken your place. He has taken my place. And he says on that ground that he has taken our place. If we believe, number one, that Jesus is the final sacrifice for sin. Number two. That Jesus is your substitute. The penalty you should have borne. The guilt you should have borne. Jesus bore that. If we believe that. Number three. That Jesus is the Savior. The only Savior. And your personal Savior. If we believe that. That Jesus it's a sufficiency, sufficient for you today, sufficient for you in life, and sufficient for you across the bar of death, sufficient for you even to the very gate of heaven. It says, if we believe on him, on him as a substitute, on him as a sacrifice, on him as a savior, on him as a sufficiency, who delivered, who was delivered for us your offenses and was raised again for justification. Now, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified, you understand now? Therefore, being forgiven, therefore, being set free by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
A reconciliation has taken place. And we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. At that time we believed. We were identified with Christ. Chapter 6. It says in verse 4. Therefore were buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also shall walk in newness of life. Identification came with the Lord Jesus Christ. That thing we call conversion. Actually, it's like a covenant. He, Christ, the Savior, having paid the price, bought us and brought us out of our degradation, out of our defilement, and were joined unto him. It's like in the language of covenant, we're married unto him. Chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, it says in verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law, by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. Married unto Christ. Married to the Savior. Married to the one that paid the price for redemption. I was married unto him in a covenant relationship. And he says, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. He says, we're married. And the result of the marriage is that we're bringing forth fruit unto the Lord. What kind of fruit? The fruit of freedom from sin. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit coming to him. Because of the price he has paid. And because we received him. Because we believed him. All our guilt. All our condemnation. All the punishment of sin. That we should have borne. He took everything away. And because he has taken that away. With that justification and that faith in him now we're free for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death it's cancelled the death penalty it's cancelled the punishment but how do we know in our own hearts that that has been done. There must be an assurance in the believer that if you died today, if I died today, I will see his face in glory. There must be an assurance by the Spirit of the Lord. That assurance comes how? Chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Have you seen that the initial evidence, initial assurance, the witness of the Spirit that we belong to the Lord is the Spirit of God himself that does that. On what basis? On the basis of the very fact that Jesus Christ lives 
within us. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I read from verse 27. We children of God were born again. Our sins are forgiven. And the Spirit is bearing witness. There's a witness, a still small voice inside us saying, We belong to God. What will the Spirit of God see in us before He bears that kind of witness? Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ comes into us, and the Spirit of God has seen that penetration of the Christ of Calvary coming into our heart and he knows now we can have the hope of glory and so he bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God what transaction took place at that time when Christ came into us that's in chapter 1 of Colossians, reading from verse 13. Who has delivered us, who has liberated us, who has taken us out from the power of darkness, the power that held us in weakness, the power that held us in sinfulness in the past. Christ, by his atonement, delivered us, liberated us, set us free from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In him we have redemption. Then it says, through his blood. His blood. I need to refer to the Old Testament for you to understand the value of that blood. The essence of that blood. The significance of that blood. In Leviticus chapter 17, reading from verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You think about Christ? His life was in the blood. If he gave his blood, then he gave his life. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar. To make an atonement for your souls. The blood makes an atonement for the soul. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. By the way, that's why the offering of Cain was rejected. It had no blood in it. There must be the life of the substitute. And it is the life of that substitute replacing you, taking your place, that makes you, that grants you, that justification. And the moment you believe that, there is an unshakable assurance that Christ is in you. The hope of glory. Come to Romans, as we talk about the blood that makes an atonement. Romans chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 9. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than being justified by his blood. There's no justification without his blood. There's no forgiveness without his blood. There is no acceptance into the assembly of those who have life, eternal life, without his blood. Because you are dead. You see and trespasses. But now you are justified by his blood. He gave up his life so you can have that life. He died so you might live. It says much more than be now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. Look at this one. By whom we have now received the atonement. By his blood we have received the atonement. The blood has given us forgiveness. The blood has given us salvation. The blood has given us his very life. He gave his life so that we can have that life. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It says, the assurance we have of salvation, the assurance we have of justification, the assurance we have of the possibility of getting to heaven is because of the blood he shed for us. Come back to verse 13. So you can get the flow of what Christ has done and why he has done it and the effect upon your life, upon my life of what Christ has done. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1 verse 13. Wherefore, get up your loin, the loins of your mind. It's saying salvation does not come by hands down nothing to do if god wants to save me let him save me you have a part it says tighten up put on your belt get up the loins of your mind your mind is going this way this way and that way your mind is wandering and your life is flabby it says wake up tighten your belt and get up the, la the loins of your mind. Be sober. And hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children. When you are born again. That's what happens. Not fashioning yourselves. According to the former lusts. In your ignorance. It says what you did. In your days of ignorance must not become the standard, the pattern of your life. It says all the former lusts, former habits, former character, former behavior, let it go. But a seed which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time 
of your sojourning here in fear. Fear God, reverence God, honor God, for as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation reserved, received by tradition from your fathers. It says all the things were received by tradition. All the things were received by pass it to me. Pass it to them. Tell them. Tell us. All those things were received by that kind of passing it on by the tradition from our seniors. From our fathers. He said all those things do not save but were saved. Verse 19. With the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot is that salvation that we received and the gospel that we believed that actually grants us this assurance unshakable immovable and we know we have a lively hope of glory first corinthians chapter 15 reading here from verse 1 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 moreover brethren this one has saved justified redeemed it says moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel the good news the living lively message that i deliver unto you it says which i preached unto you which ye also have received to be saved we hear the message we appropriate the message we believe the message we internalize personalize the message as if christ died for me alone it says you believed it you received it where in his time we don't come in and crawl out we don't come in and then go out we stand there we abide in it we continue in it it says by which in verse 2 also ye are saved if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain, but delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, he died for one purpose, for our sins, that he may forgive us. That he may set us free if we don't have the assurance of forgiveness we have not appropriated the value of the death of christ for us on the cross of calvary if we don't have the freedom from sin liberation from sin a total separation from sin we have not appropriated the value of what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. And then he says in verse 4, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He bore our sins, he bore our penalty, and it is on that ground we have assurance. Let's come back now to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Reading from verse 1. Therefore, be justified by faith. We are peace with God. Be justified by faith. When you are in a state of justification. When your spiritual life has been accepted 
acceptable in the sight of the Lord. All doubt is gone. Wondering whether you will see his face in peace on the final day, all that is gone. Now we're justified. We're peace with God. And it is through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand we abide we continue and rejoice in hope of the glory of god not only so but we glory in tribulations also when persecutions come we don't say but why now why am I going through this? Why is that happening? We rejoice when we're sinners in the field of sin, no persecution. The world loved us because we're part of them. And this tribulation and this trouble and this persecution is an evidence. The people of the world see they've got no more part of them. And since they even gave recognition to that, that's part of assurance. And we rejoice knowing that tribulation workers patience. And patience experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. This is the lively hope we have in the Lord. That when he comes, we'll go with him. Hope make us not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners, Christ died for us. And after we received that death of Christ for ourselves, we come to the other side. We're not children of God, much more than verse 9. Be now justified by his blood. We shall be saved. From wrath through him. Saved from wrath through him. What's going to be that result? As we're saved, redeemed, justified, forgiven, liberated. What's the difference between now and then? Today, yesterday. The present and the past. Look at the difference. When you come to know the Lord as your personal Savior, the assurance is things are different now. Something happened to me. Chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. What does that mean? The old man is the man in the man. The man in the woman is the inner man. That makes us to do what we're doing. You see the hand? The hand can do nothing without the instruction of the inner man raise it up you raise it up stretch it out you stretch it out it's at the command of the inward man you see a bad picture a corrupting picture a polluting scripture seeing it for the first time is accidental what makes you to look at it again and gaze at it is the instruction of the man on the inside the natural man look at that isn't that cute look at that isn't that inviting 
And when you look again, that's no more accidental. We say that's voluntary. It's by your volition you do that. How? By the man, the old man that lives on the inside. But when that old man that gives instruction to your eyes, to your tongue, to your hand, when that old man is crucified, his authority over you is crucified, nullified. It's not as strong as it was before because now he is crucified. Look at that. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. To crucify the old man is the first stage. The next stage, get rid of him. Destroy him. Get him out of the way. That he's not having, he's not able to have any authority over you anymore. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. Verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See what he says there? Now that you understand, you believe that Jesus died for you. You believe he took your sins away. You believe you are identified with him. You believe he lives on the inside of you. The practical implication of that is verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign over your mortal body. That is, now you have the power. Now you have the authority. Now you have the tool to overcome the devil. That it not reign over your mortal body. That you should obey it in the lost thereof. Verse 16. Do ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? A servant here to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death, you say you're a believer, and you obey the dictates of sin, is unto death, of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked. That ye were, past tense, ye were the servants of sin, but now ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. How is obedience possible? How is righteousness possible? Verse 18, being then made free from sin. That's what happens at salvation. That's why we have assurance. We know by the evidence of a new life, practical, positive, righteous life, that we're children of God, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. But now, be made free from sin. And become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And I pray that evidence of the new life will be in every one of us in Jesus' name. I didn't hear my amen. Titus chapter 2. What happens? 
when we come to the Lord and we have definite, bona fide, undoubtable, indisputable salvation. If somebody is living like this, like that, inconsistent, unfaithful, carnal, fleshly, on Sunday, all right, Monday to Friday in the office, it does like the Romans do. It's like them. You cannot talk about that fellow having definite, indisputable salvation. But how do we have that assurance? Unshakable, indisputable, undoubtable kind of assurance for the hope of glory. We come to Titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men it appears unto all men but the appearance doesn't mean everybody has grabbed it it's like when the sun appears the people will shut their doors and they shut their windows and although the sun is shining and the sun has appeared. It doesn't bring any light to their room. They shut the windows. There must be a voluntary action. That you go there to the window and open the window and let the light come in. Salvation has appeared. And you must give your heart. Open your heart. Open your life to that salvation. He says in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and what they lost was should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That salvation appears. The Savior has finished the work on the cross of Calvary. And he says, it is finished. And since you know your salvation has been accomplished, then you come to him, you receive him, and he brings in the light. Darkness goes, what they desires go, what they lost, they all go, and the desire to satisfy the flesh unlawfully, all that goes away. Hard drugs, Come in your life, all that goes away. Everything you have been taking to stimulate yourself, all that goes away. Now you deny ungodliness and you deny what they lost and you live soberly. A quiet life, a peaceful life, a serene life. That the people who knew you before to be the clown, to be the jester, and to be the one frivolous, careless, they now see that you are quiet, you are serene, you are peaceful, you are thoughtful, you are matured, you think, you talk, not out of the excitement of the moment. But you are a thinker. Before you talk, you think. You are sober. And it says, not only that you are sober, you are righteous. You are right. And th the things you do, they are reasonable. You look at the rule of life. The rule of law. You put a spiritual ruler, a scriptural ruler, at the conduct of your life and it's straight righteous godly like god godly behaving as a child of god in this present world verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He doesn't redeem us from half of our iniquities. Seventy percent of our iniquities. And then we're still holding on to some because that gives us money, bribery and corruption. That gives us some leeway into some companies. If we can bribe them through all that kind of iniquity is taken away and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's what he does. And that is what gives us assurance that is preparing us for glory. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. He did not sin. You were the sinner. But why then did he die? When he did not sin, he tasted death for every man. And when you come out of your position, out of your pollution, out of your partnership with the people of the world, you come out of the gang. You come out of your past. And you come to Christ. Understanding that he tasted death for you. Salvation becomes yours. Then verse 10. But it became him. It befitted him. For whom are all things. And by whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory. Is it through that salvation? The gateway of salvation. It brings us to glory. To make the captain, the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. But it does beyond salvation. It gives much more than salvation. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He calls them brethren. They know in their hearts they are the children of God. Unshakable assurance of the hope of glory how can you have that unshakable assurance your repentance must be clear clear cut nothing doubtful about it your repentance must be full and there's no half haphazard way to it with all your heart you really mean to serve the lord you really mean to be saved and you look at everything of the past what has that profited me it profits me nothing and if you continue what will be the end of it it will be suffering in hell forever and ever and therefore you make up your mind and you come out of everything of the past and it's so clear that Jesus can bear witness to that. In John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the main. Which thou gavest me out of the world. Out of the world. Not one leg. In Christianity, 
one other leg in the traditions of the world, in the idolatry of the world, in the masquerades of the world, in the perdition and perversion of the world, but we are totally out of the world. Thine they were by creation, and thou gavest them me by redemption, and they have kept thy word. That's Jesus bearing witness to those disciples. About those disciples, they have assurance of the hope of glory because Jesus said concerning them, they have kept thy word. Look at verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. That's what gave them assurance. They belong to the Lord. They have the hope of glory because Jesus said they have received them and they have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou hast sent me. Look at verse 14. I have given them thy word. He repeats that a third time. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. When Christ from heaven can testify about you, that in your life, in your conduct, in your character, in your behavior, in your lifestyle, in your habits, in your private dwelling that you are not of the world even as he is not of the world there's no greater testimony than that that jesus can bear bear witness to your salvation you have that unsh unshakable assurance of the hope of glory luke chapter 10 luke Chapter 10, reading from verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The 70 came back and they gave testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. Healing, deliverance, miracles in their ministry. Jesus said, yes, I saw that. I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. But he says, but you know something greater? Your names are written in heaven. What greater assurance can we have? When the Spirit of God, sent by Jesus Christ, bear witness in our heart, Nobody sees the book of life in heaven, but Jesus knows that book. He knows the names that are there. And then he bore witness that their lives were different. He bore witness that their names were written in heaven. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing this, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, in us and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. God bearing witness. 
That's unshakable assurance. And Jesus bearing witness, you're not of the world, you have received the word, you are obeying the word. That gives unshakable assurance. The spirit of God bearing witness with your heart, you are a child of God. That gives unshakable assurance. And now the apostle looking at them. And he says, I knew you before as Thessalonians, natural Thessalonians. I see you now, saved Thessalonians. And I see three things. Number one, faith. How do I see your faith? Your work of faith. I see number two, love. How do I see your love? Your labor of love. And I see your hope, your patience of hope. And I now know you are of God. That's assurance. It tells us in verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Your lives turned around. Your lives changed. You became followers of the Lord. You have heard how Jesus our Lord lived a life of meekness, a life of obedience to the Father, and you are followers of the Lord, and you are followers of us, those of us who are believers before you. You are not looking back to Thessalonians like yourself. You are looking up to the saints of God who have been in the faith before you. And you are now followers of the Lord and followers of us. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. That's evidence. You are children of God. The Father bears witness. The Son bears witness. The Spirit bears witness. And then the Apostle bore witness. Not only that, look at verse 7. So that ye white samples, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and but in Achaia, but also in every place, every place where you have lived, every place where you have walked. Every place where you communicate and commune with people. Every place where you interact with people. Your faith to God's word is spread abroad. So that we need not speak anything. The people around you. The people in your community. They also offer unshakable assurance. That they knew you before. And they know you now. And they know the change that has taken place in your life. They can testify about your life. But they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The elder worship has also be a witness. He was coming here before for Juju. I've not seen him now. I've not seen her now for a long time. And he would always send his driver to go and collect charm, charcoal from that man that made some signs on the sand on the ground. I've not seen him now for some time. It's like it's not using my medicine anymore. And then sometimes he met you. Uh uh, Mr. So and so, Madam So and so, what happened? No problem again. No night uh, oppression again. You are not coming for your materials again. Ah, uh, I've left all those things and I belong to God. Even the ones that were in my house, I swept them away. I burnt them. It's an evidence, unsure, unshakable assurance that even the people of the world can tell 
They are not in their nightclubs anymore. You are not in their bribery gang anymore. And you are not partaking of their festivals anymore. Now you have turned away from idols. And you are serving the living and the true God. And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Acts, chapter 19. I'm reading here from verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds, many of them also, which used curious arts, magical materials, idolatrous garments, and those occultic regalia. They brought their books together, and they bound them before all men. You see that the men before all men that they brought those things and bunch them. They can testify. These people are different now. A change has come. It says they bunch them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it to be fifty pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed mightily grew the word of God and prevailed there were people now instead of keeping a notebook of charms a notebook of local medicine a notebook of dreams and interpretation a notebook of the sayings of the elders. They burnt all that. And now they read their Bible. And the word of the Lord grew. They are now committed to the word of the Lord. Seeing them, you have assurance. These ones have the hope of glory. Acts chapter 17. Verse 11, Acts 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Can you tell? You can tell about the assurance of these people. They received the word of God. Not only that now, they were wedded to their Bibles, to the word of God. And they were searching the word of God very closely. And it says every day, because now a new change had happened in their hearts in their lives and the people that saw them could now tell they had unshakable assurance of the hope of glory psalm 122 psalm 122 verse 1 i was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad. I was glad, happy, that I'm now going to the house of God where the Bible is taught, where God is worshipped in truth and in spirit, where due honor is given unto the Lord who is glorious in majesty and holiness. I was glad. If you say you are born again, 
and you have been going to a church and assembly where the word of God is not well taught and you had no conviction of living a righteous life. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And when you don't, you just say what they say in your old assembly. The grace of God covers it all. Nobody can live a life without sin. And then you go on. But now you are here. And you have discovered here is the word of God made plain. If you are going to have unshakable assurance of the hope of glory, the Father will be a witness to that. That you are out of the world and that you have received the word that the father gave the lord jesus jesus will be a witness that you're a real child of god you're not of the world even as he is not of the world the spirit will be a witness that you are a child of god and then the works of your life faith hope love will be a witness in the hearts of believers around you that you are really a child of God. The idol worshippers who you have been visiting before and you don't visit them anymore. The old man friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, same partner that you have been visiting once in a while and now there's a total break. He also can testify she doesn't come anymore. If I go to her, she doesn't accept anymore. She's a totally changed person. He can bear witness also, unshakable assurance of the glory, hope of glory. And then also, the people who worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, they come to you. This is our local church. This is our headquarters church. Now that you say you've given your life to the Lord, let's go. And now your reaction, your action, your response will show whether you have this unshakable assurance or not. Here is somebody having unshakable assurance. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I pray that this unshakable assurance will be evident in your life in Jesus' name. Did I hear my normal amen? First John chapter 3. In First John chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 19. First John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 19. And hereby we know that we have the truth. Here's how we have unshakable assurance. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. If your heart is all the time accusing you, you know that you are not standing right. You know you are compromising. You know although you say you've given your life to the Lord, you're not living the life. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. And beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence. If our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. The confidence that will belong unto the Lord. And we're living the life that he expects a child of God should live. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then 
will be great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us all fast a profession if your profession of faith you saw the father can testify about the son can affirm the holy ghost can confirm the works of faith and love and hope can also testify to and the people of the world that you have come out from they can tell there's a definite change transformation in your life that profession let us all fast to eat for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of infirmities but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to hell in time of need and when that grace abides and abounds in you and you remain and you are not going away from the lord coming in going out you are stable you are steadfast then that hope of glory will have unshakable assurance in your life in jesus name colossians chapter 1 Verse 23, if ye continue, if ye continue, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, you continue, you abide, you stand, you will not compromise if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I Paul a made a minister for 27 to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. I pray God will accomplish that in your life. And this hope of glory will never leave you in your mind, in your heart, in your focus in Jesus' name. Because if we don't have this hope of glory, if all we have is all the testimony of I got this, I got that in the world, that's not enough. First John chapter 3, verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what man of love, what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That's assurance here. Now are we the sons of God. There's bold assurance here. An assurance you cannot contradict. Unshakable, firm. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when 
he shall appear. We shall be like him, but an assurance. But we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Those who have that unshakable hope, unshakable assurance, they make sure that no stain and no worldliness, no carnality, nothing of the flesh abides and stays with them. They go back to the blood of the Lamb and they wash and they are clean and they are constantly washed and constantly clean. Those are the people that have the unshakable assurance of the hope of glory. You want to look inwards. You want to hear the Father talk about your life. You want to have Jesus testifying about your life. And the Holy Ghost bearing witness with your heart. Before you can settle down and say, everything is all right. I have that unshakable assurance of the hope of glory. We're going to rise up. And we're going to talk to the Lord in prayer. Check up in your life. You must have this assurance before you pass on from here to the next great beyond. If you die anytime, suddenly, would you have this unshakable assurance of the hope of glory for your wife? Have that assurance about you. My husband has gone to heaven. I know it's lying. Will your husband have that unshakable assurance concerning you? I know her life. Will your neighbors have that unshakable assurance? We know his life. Beyond that, above that, will the heavenly father know that you have got the word of God. You accepted the word of God. You were born again by the word of God. And your life was totally different. Will Jesus be a witness unto you and for you with unshakable assurance that you are really saved? Talk to the Lord in prayer. Ask him, ask the Lord, Lord, how about my life? What do you see concerning my life? Tell him. Ask him. And in your heart, if you know, there is something to settle with the Lord. Why don't you go to Calvary spiritually and say, Lord, here am I. Cleanse me. Wash me. Purge me. Make a change in my life. Transform my life. Let there be an indisputable evidence of righteousness that I belong unto the Lord. Open your mouth and pray. If you don't have assurance and you die, whoever buried you, whatever they say at the burial, it's all in vain. There must be this unshakable assurance. That you are born again. That your life, your name was written in the book of life. That your activities were not just religious activities. Those activities came out of your genuine heart love for God. Cleansed. Washed. Purged. And then you have grace to live in newness of life. Settle it with the Lord. If there's any restitution to be made, you cannot have clear conscience until that restitution is done. Whatever you have stolen, you have to restore to the rightful owner. A small thing, a big thing, money, 
material things and you sign somebody else's signature to get something in his name he didn't know about it you need to make right your life if you don't there's no assurance of the hope of glory you are not living right for somebody's daughter having that kind of defiling relationship in a secret it's not enough to say forgive me forgive me yes god forgives you need to make restitution to the parents was so bright you was sorrow in your heart sorrow for sin if you are responsible for destruction of things in your school destruction of things in your company destruction of things in any establishment it's not enough to say oh lord forgive me yes he forgives he expects you to go and make right your life that's why the cause of that destruction you're sorry and you're willing to pay for the damages getting to heaven needs this unshakable assurance that a real child of god Keeping two wives alive, the first one still alive, and you married, you pay dowry, you live together, husband and wife, and now you abandon that, and then you jump to another one. Restitution is necessary for you to have unshakable assurance. You have two husbands. The first one is still alive. And he married you properly. And now you left. And you married another one. The first husband is still alive. To have unshakable assurance. You must settle that. Clear conscience. The place you are walking. When you are about to leave. Disrupted everything, destroyed different things, important documents. Now you have left the place. Now you are in another place. You have clear conscience after you've done that. If you're going to have unshakable assurance of the hope of glory, pray and tell the Lord, Lord, I am sorry. Forgive me. Let your life come out straight and clean. And then you go there and with humility and sobriety, you plead with them. This is what I did. Forgive me. You have conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Make sure you set your life for the Lord. The blood of Jesus is able to wash you whiter than snow. Having unshakable assurance of the hope of glory.